So let's get started. My name is Jehun. So I'm a faculty in the Department of Psychiatry, and I'm also affiliated by Informatics and Genetic Genomics from area. So today I'll discuss the project that studies the effect of common and rare variants in bipolar disorder using the genetic data from extended pedigrees. So this project involves both data analysis and method development. And I'm kind of sorry to you still the people who have already listened to my talk. So yeah. So bipolar disorder consists of episodes of mania and depression, and it is common complex disorder. It affects millions of individuals worldwide. And there are several different types of bipolar disorder, such as bipolar disorder one, BP2, cyclothymic disorder, and other types of bipolar disorder. And BP1 is considered to be the most severe form of bipolar disorder. And it has a high heritability, estimated to be 80% from twin studies. And there have been a few large-scale bipolar disorder GWAS, mainly conducted from by Psychiatric Genomics Consortium, PGC. So the first large-scale GWAS analyzed about 4,400 cases and about 6,000 controls, published in 2008. Next one analyzed about 12,000 cases and 51,000 controls in 2012. And the latest BPG was that analyzed about 30,000 cases and about 170,000 controls uh, identified 30 loci associated with the bipolar disorder, which is contained in bioarchive. And schizophrenia is another major psychiatric disorder. It also has high, high heritability, which is comparable to BP. And interestingly, schizophrenia GWAS found many more loci than BP GWAS. So this schizophrenia GWAS in 2014 analyzed similar number of cases and controls, but they identified about 108 loci compared to only 30 loci from BP GWAS. So what's causing the difference? So one possibility is that there's a greater heterogeneity in individuals with bipolar disorder because there are a few different types of BP, like BP1 and BP2. And another possibility is that higher proportion of BP risk may derive from the variant not present in SNP chips. And because common uh, GWAS only focuses on common SNPs, we may be missing these SNPs. So this is called missing heritability. So GWAS found many common SNPs associated with many different traits shown in the figure, but we also found that common SNPs explain only the small fraction of heritability. And there could be other contributors to the missing heritability, such as rare variants or stru structural variants. And recently, these types of variants receive great attention because studies show that they do indeed affect the complex traits. And especially rare variants may have larger effect than common variants. So several studies have already tried to identify rare variants that influence BP using whole exome sequencing and whole genome sequencing. And for example, the first one, the Ament et al., showed the effect of rare variants in neuronal excitability gene on BP. And there are several other uh, studies, such as uh, whole genome sequencing in genetic isolate and a couple of family-based exome sequencing studies. And this study analyzed the rare variant in specific gene in large pedigrees. And these are all family-based studies. So why do we study families? To, analyze, uh, to detect the effect of rare variants, and there are several reasons for this. The first reason is that the, the large effect variants would be segregated in families, so we can look for those segregation. The second reason is that even if not perfectly segregated, the rare alleles may be enriched in families, which means increased allele frequency and higher statistical power to detect their effect. Third, as I will show you later, we can even detect the sequencing errors by checking the Mendelian, in Mendelian inheritance pattern of variants, and we can even correct those errors. And fourth, we can study the effect of de novo mutations, which plays important role in certain psychiatric disorders. And family-based studies are robust, more robust to population stratification, which may cause false positives. So to study the impact of both rare and common variants on BP, we analyzed 26 extended pedigrees affected by BP1, which is a more severe form of BP. And our pedigrees are from two Latin American populations, 15 pedigrees from Central Valley of Costa Rica, 11 pedigrees from Antioquia, Colombia, 
So in this study, we extensively ascertained families for multiple cases BP1, and we believe that this would reduce the heterogeneity between BP1 and other milder forms of BP. Also, we, we focus on families from two Latin American populations that are considered as closely related genetic isolates. And the pedigree size varies from 12 to 355 individuals, and each, each family has about between 2 to 44 BP1 individuals. So this is the information on our pedigree. So there are 26 pedigrees, and some of the families are really large. So for example, this CR201 family <coughs> has 355 individuals, and CR004 has about 187 individuals. And we have 206 BP1 individuals in total, and 138 are related controls. And we have SNP data for 838 individuals, and whole genome sequencing data for 449 individuals. So here's how we genotype and sequence our, our families. So we have 1,439 individuals from 26 pedigrees, and we genotype 856 of them using only 2.5 million microarray, so it's 2.5 million SNPs. And among them, we sequenced 450 of them using Exxon Peak software to choose individuals to sequence. So they were chosen for sequencing because they would provide good amount of information to impute the variants in the remaining family members. So we did the high cover whole genome sequencing at Illumina, about 36 eggs, and Illumina did, their, Illumina did the variant calling using their variant caller called Cassava, and then they also sent us the BAM file. So using this uh, microarray and whole genome sequencing data, we first call different types of genetic variants. So we use GATK to call SMB, and we use genome stream and PEN-CMB to call CMBs, and we use lobster software to call STR, which is short tendon repeat, and we use a Tulio Dino software to call Dino mutations. And we did turnover ton of quality controls to obtain high quality genotypes for these genetic variants. And then we perform the genotype refinement using polymer software. So it, this software corrects the genotype based on the sequencing quality and then the family structure. We then perform the genotype imputation using software called GG, which considers family structure. So this software imputes everybody in a family who was not sequenced, and it has very high accuracy in imputing rare variants. So I, I list individuals who work on each of these analyses. So using this rich genetic information, we try to evaluate the impact of our rare and common variant on BP1 in these pedigrees. So specifically, we focus on two major questions about the genetic etiology of BP1. So the first question is related to the genetic architecture of BP1 in these pedigrees. So we are trying to ask, what's the overall contribution of genetic variant to BP1? And we use the burden analysis to answer this question. So for common variant, we, use the, uh, we calculate the polygenic risk scores, PRS, of each individual and compare the PRS of individual with bipolar disorder versus the controls. For rare variants, we compare the burden of rare deleterious variant in a specific gene set we focus, which I will discuss later. And another question we're trying to address in this study was to identify genetic loci segregating with the BP1 in these pedigrees. And we call this segregation analysis. And for common variant, we use the linkage, traditional linkage method. And for rare variants, we develop new methods to identify the segregation of rare variants, the specific gene set, which I will also discuss later. So first, let me discuss how we analyze the data. So we have 26 families, 1,400, about 40 samples, and we genotype 856 individuals from 26 families. And after QC, we have 138 individuals that include 26 BP1 at about 2 million SNPs. And for sequencing data, you move, if you move to here, we have 454 sequence, whole genome sequencing data for 154 individuals from 22 families. So we didn't sequence four families. And we exclude five individuals due to the quality control issue. And we try to impute the 334 individuals that have, that have only micro data. And at the end, we have 782 individuals that include 190 BP1. So this table shows how we analyze, uh, how we obtain each genetic variant and how we analyze them. So we use ton of software to obtain different types of genetic variants. 
and we apply the polynomial genotype refinement to only whole genome sequencing SMB data, and we've imputed the whole genome sequencing SMB and whole genome sequencing CMB data. And the number of samples or individuals is a little different between different types of genetic variants because the QC is more different. In general, we have about 190 BP1 individuals and 130 controls. And we did a very stringent QC, and we used the whole genome sequencing SMB data for PRS and rare variant burden and segregation analysis. For array SNP data, we used for linkage. And for whole genome sequencing CMB data for rare variant burden and segregation analysis. And array CMB for rare variant burden. And we use STR only for linkage. And for renewable mutation, we use for burden analysis. So this table shows the sequencing statistics at variant level. And we compare the sequencing calls between GATK and then the Kasava calls that we got from Illumina. So GATK detected about 21.8 million SMBs and about 3.2 million indels, while Kasava detected 23.4 million SMBs. So there are about 2.2 million SMBs that are only detected by Kasava, but we found that many of them have poor sequencing quality according to GATK QC, and they were removed from GATK calls. And all sequence individuals were genotype microdata. So we first checked how many SNPs in the microdata were detected by sequencing. And this table shows that the sequencing failed to detect 2% of SNPs present in SNP chip data. And we call them false negative SNPs. And this figure shows the distribution of the minor allele frequency of those SNPs. And we found that more than 70% of SNPs, those SNPs have allele frequency greater than 5%. So sequencing failed to detect some common SNPs. We then compared the genotype concordance between the whole genome sequencing data and microdata, and this plot shows the genotype concordance rate per individual, and everyone, everyone has good concordance rate. And this is the PCA plot of our individuals with 1,000 genomes. So the Columbia pedigrees are indicated with the red cross, and Costa Rica pedigrees are indicated with the blue X. So it may it might be hard to see, but our pedigrees uh, our pedigrees overlap with the AMR population of Wonton Genome, which is the uh, the admixed Americans from Wonton Genome. And we then use the polymute software to do the genotype refinement. So before running polymute we had about 157,000 Mendel errors and polymute corrected almost all of them. And we wanted to know how polymute changed the genotype. So for this, we computed the average genotype quality, GQ, and depth, DP of genotypes that are changed and unchanged by polymute. So in this table, the first, first row shows the genotypes that are unchanged by polymute. So original genotype is AA, and it's AA after polymute. And the average GQ for those genotypes are about 93. The second row, is the genotype changed by polymute? So the original genotype is AA, and then it got changed to AC by polymute. And its genotype quality is much lower than the first row. And the last row is the genotype imputed by polymute, and it has the lowest GQ and depth. So we found that genotype changed by polymute had lower GQ and DP values, which is nice. And we then performed the GG imputation to impute the 336 individuals with only microdata. And we imputed uh, only biolylic SMB and deletions on autosomes. And after imputation, we wanted to know how good imputation was. And one way to measure this imputation quality is check the genotype missing rate or genotype missing rate of imputed individuals, because the lower genotype missing rate means better imputation. And another metric to measure this imputation quality is we can check the genotype concordance rate between the imputed data and microdata. So the, as I showed before, most of the SNPs in the array data were present in whole genome sequencing, and they were imputed by GG, so we can check the genotypes between microdata and imputed data. And you might wonder whether those SNPs in array data were used in GG imputation, but this is different from the traditional the population-based LD method. They use LD, uh, LD metric. This in this family imputation, the microdata were only used to infer the in inheritance vectors, IBs, in families, and they are not used in imputation, so we can check the genotype concordance. So this plot shows the results of imputation. So y-axis is the genotype missing rate, 
x-axis, the genotype concordance rate between imputed and microarray data, and each dot is each individual who was imputed. So there we, this plot shows a nice neg negative correlation between genotype missing rate and the genotype concordance rate. And except for the one person up here, everyone has lower than 10% missing rate. Yeah, yeah, 10% missing rate, and then greater than 97% genotype concordance rate. So we think that the imputation was quite accurate. And we call the CMBs using called the genome strips up there. So figure A shows the number of CMBs per individual, and we found three outliers, which I have to remove. And plot B shows the number of CMBs per chromosome, and we found some promotable regions, so we removed those deletions in, this, in these regions. And figure C shows the Mendelian error rate per trio, and everyone has a very low Mendelian error rate. And because these two pedigrees are from two Latin American populations, we also look at admixture. So we used admixture software to estimate the genome-wide ancestry proportion using the uh, European and African and then Native Americans as reference populations. And we estimate this using the SNP data. So the left figure shows that the majority of uh, ancestry proportion in these pedigrees were Europeans, mostly here. But we also observed some relatively high proportion of Native Americans and some African ancestry. We then correlated this proportion with the BP1 status, and we found the significant association between the two. So, for example, for European ancestry, we for the increase, so we uh, so the risk of BP1 increases with the increase in proportion in European ancestry, while we observe the opposite trend for Native American ancestry and the African ancestry. So these are the results of QC and admixture and imputation and so on. So I'm going to go back to the main analysis that I discussed. So first, I'm going to discuss the polygen risk score analysis that, that, that we tried to identify the burden of common variant. And Sue was the main person who did this analysis. So we used the two main GWAS summary statistics for PRS. So first statistic is the PGC GWAS summary statistic for BP1. And the other is the PGC GWAS statistics for schizophrenia. And using these test statistics, test statistics, we try to calculate the PRS of our samples that consist of 190 BP1 individuals and 130 controls using the whole genome sequencing data. And we use the what's called PRSICE software to calculate the PRS at five different GWAS PV threshold. And we calculate the PRS separately for BP1 and schizophrenia. And the PRS is calculated as the weighted sum of risk alleles, so beta j times SNP ij, across SNPs of interest for each individual, and where the beta j or the effect size come from the GWAS summary statistics, they are usually log modulation. So the higher PRS indicates higher polygenic risk scores or higher polygenic risk for the individual. And to test the association between PRS and BP1 status, we use the two regression models. So one is the linear regression, mo linear mixed model, which models the PRS as a dependent variable and the BP1 status as a predictor. And the other model is the generalized linear mixed model, which is the other way, so which assesses the other being BP1 as the function of increasing mean PRS. So both approaches took into account the relationship among family members and we also take into account the global estimate of admixture for European ancestry. So this is the result of PRS using BP1 summary statistics from PGC. So we observed the association p-values less than 0.05 for LMMM for these two GWAS threshold, 0 0.01, 0 0.001, and for GLLM at 0.01 GWAS threshold. In all cases, the BP1 individuals had a higher PRS mean had a higher mean PRS than controls, and we didn't observe lower association p-values for more significant GWAS threshold as shown here. And this may be because there were not enough SNPs to calculate the PRS because there are only very few SNPs. So this results show that our BP1 individuals carry higher polygenic risk for BP1 than controls. We then wanted to ask how much higher 
the polygen risk or polygen risk the BPO individuals carried compared to controls. So for this, we com we com we calculate the variance explained by PRS, and these are the R square for different GWAS threshold, and we observe highest R square at 0.01 GWAS threshold, which is about 1.5%. And it is important to note that this is noticeably smaller than the variance explained by PRS in the latest PGC BP GWAS, which were where they reported the weighted average R square of 8%. So one explanation, one explanation for this difference is population difference PGC in our pedigrees, where the PGC samples are mostly Europeans, while our samples consist of have some special component of Native American and African ancestry, as, as I showed before. However, we found that more than 90% of SNPs, as shown here, in the PGC GWAS are present in our pedigrees. So we consider it unlikely that this population difference solely explains the difference in R square between PGC and our pedigrees. And another, another explanation is that our controls are naturally controls because they are closely related to BP1 individuals, so they may carry some polygenic burden. And another, another explanation is that BP1 in our pedigrees are simply as polygenic than BP1 in population samples. And this is the PRS results using the schizophrenia summary statistics from PGC. So previous, B, previous PGC GWAS found that the PRS estimate from schizophrenia GWAS explained the variance of BP. So they are kind of related. But in our pedigrees, the PRS estimate from the schizophrenia GWAS is not associated with the increased risk of BP1 at any GWAS threshold. So this may reflect another different characteristics of BP1 between PGC and our pedigrees, where our, our pedigrees were ascertained for multiple closely related cases of BP1. Next, I'm going to discuss the burden of the rare variant analysis. So we are, we are especially interested in burden of deleterious, rare deleterious variant in specific gene set that we came up with. And I'm going to discuss this gene set first. So to find the genes that are more likely to be related to BP1, we use three sources of information. So first, we use what's called LD score, L, stratified LD score regression method using the PGC BP1 summary statistics. And we test these 10 cell type groups. These are the 10 cell type groups that LD score regression paper identified. And we observed the enrichment of heritability in only in the central nervous system group, which is CNS. And in this group, there are 8,714 8, genes. And another source we used was the 99 genes near, near our linkage peaks, which I will discuss later. And we also used the PGC BP1 GWAS results, and we identified 72 genes near the BP1 GWAS hit. So after merging these genes, we have 8,757 unique genes that contain at least one deleterious SMB in our pedigrees, which I will discuss next. So how do we define rare and deleterious? So we use the internal and external sources of all the frequency to define what's rare. So for the internal source, we calculate the minor allele frequency using, the, using all sequence individuals in our pedigree. And for external source, we use the allele frequency of the Colombian simultan genome and Latino XJ for SMB data. And for CMB data, we use the database of genomic variants for RA CMBs and one third genome CMB data for whole genome sequence CMB. And if the variant from our pedigree is present in external source, we say it is rare if the minor allele frequency is less than 1% in the external source. However, some variants only present in our pedigrees, so we say they are rare if the minor allele frequency using our internal source is less than 10%. And for the deleterious variant, we only used SMBs. We didn't use for CMBs, so they are stop gain, stop loss, price side, and damaging variants according to polyphen 2. So using this criteria, we have about 25,000 rare deleterious SMBs in about 8,200 genes from our gene set. And as for CMBs, we have about 2,200 array, rare array CMBs and 4,400 rare whole genome sequencing CMBs in our gene set. So using this rare variant, we calculate the burden score. So for SMB, it was the mean burden of rare deleterious SMB in our gene set. 
And for CMBs, it was the number of genes in the genes that intersected by real CMBs because some CMBs can intersect multiple genes. Mm -hmm. And we corrected these burden scores for the mean burden of all real SMB for SMB and for CMBs, we correct for the total number of CMBs and yeah. average size of all CMBs. So this was necessary because for SMB, if, if the individual has a lot of rare variants, then this individual is like, likely to carry also a lot of rare deleterious variants. So we need to correct for this. So after this, we continue to normalize the residuals of the burden scores. And then we ran both LMNG and LLM similar to PRS to find the association between BPO and status and then the residuals of the burden scores. So this is the result of the burden of rare deleterious SMBs. So this shows that our BPO individuals have higher mean burden of rare deleterious variants in, our, in the gene set that we identified. And then the p-values are a little smaller than 0.05, so yeah. And this is the result of the burden of rare CMBs. So there are five different types of CMBs here. So the top one is the CMBs, all CMBs from microarray data. The next one is the duplication from array data. The next one is the deletion from the array data. The fourth is the deletions from whole genome sequencing data. The last one is the whole genome sequencing deletion covered by at least 10 SNPs in the array data. The left figure is the GLLM, and the right figure is the LMM. And the results show that the BP1 individuals have higher burden of genes intersected by rare CMBs for both array CMB and whole genome sequence CMBs. And for array CMB, the increased burden was almost all due to the deletions because we didn't observe any increased burden due to duplication. So previous CMB studies for BP, they found no global enrichment of rare CMBs in BP individuals. So they didn't use specific genes. They used all, all the CMBs across the genome, and they focused on CMBs greater than 100 KB. And similarly, when we checked the genome-wide average number of CMBs in our data set, the, we didn't observe the significant difference between BP on individual and controls. So this result suggests that impact of CMBs on BP may derive from the smaller, if, smaller event or may be restricted to specific genes like those in our gene set. So after observing the burden signals, we then move on to the segregation analysis to actually identify specific loci that segregate with the BP. And first, we ran linkage analysis for the common variant, and so did the uh, linkage analysis. So we used the two types of the generic variant for linkage analysis. So one is about 100,000 bioallelic SNPs with a minor frequency greater than 35% from the array data that has 29 BP1 individuals. And the other generic variant is about 85,000 85, bi and multiallelic STRs from whole genome sequencing data that has 142 BP1 from 22 families. And we consider all non-BP1 subjects as phenotype missing. And we perform two-point parametric linkage method using the Mendel software to estimate the LOD with the heterogeneity. And we use the HH LOD threshold of 4.1 for the genome-wide significance level because it corresponds to LOD of 3.3 according to Landon and Kugliak. And we also perform the non-parametric linkage analysis, NPL, using the what's called rapid software and estimate the p-values using simulations. So this is the result of parametric linkage analysis showing the Manhattan plot. So circle is SMB, triangles STR. We have six genome-wide linkage peaks. Four, four of them are SMBs, two of them are STRs. And the la largest HLOD value we got is 5.03 from one STR. However, we wonder whether this HLOD threshold 4.1 is good threshold in these pedigrees. So we generate simulations under the null hypothesis of no linkage using two approaches. The first approach fixed the phenotype information of individuals and generate the genotypes using the gene dropping approach. The second approach is the other way around. We fix the genotype and we permute the phenotype by considering family structure. And, it all in, and the results show that in all simulations, we observe the HLD of 4.1 or greater in more, about 80% of replicate genome screens, where we were expected to observe only 5%, assuming the false part rate of 5%. So 
So this shows that HLOD threshold 4.1 is unlikely to be appropriate threshold for the genome-wide significant linkage in our pedigrees, and we are not sure why. And this is the result of NPL analysis. So we estimate the p-values using 250,000 simulations and also 1 million simulations. And we found nine markers with the empirical p-values less than 4.9 time, times 10 to negative 5, and most of them are SMBs. So we found 15 linkage peaks from both parametric and NPL, and there's one locus, 16Q23 locus, that had linkage peaks from both parametric and non-parametric linkage. So we look at this region more carefully. So we found 18 common SMBs in this region that are both coding and deleterious. We have 14 of them are present in this gene, PKD1L2. And we performed association analysis on those common SNPs, but none of them had a significant p-values after multiple testing correction. And we also didn't observe the difference in mean burden of deleterious <coughs> SMBs in this gene between BP1 individual and controls. So we think that maybe non-coding variants may play roles in this locus. So lastly, I'm going to discuss the, the segregation of rare deleterious variants. And for this, I developed a new method for this. So I'm going to discuss the method first. So we are interested in finding rare variants that are present in affected while they are not in unaffected. And this is what we call segregation. And there are many methods to detect these rare variants from pedigrees. However, many of them are not often scalable to large pedigrees, those in our pedigrees. And I developed a method called IBD, which is scalable to these pedigrees, but it assumes that only one founder introduced the rare variant into the family. And this assumption may be violated in some of our very large families, because some family size is less than 55. So I came up with a different approach to find the segregation of rare variant analysis. So the main intuition behind this approach is that we want to compute a p-value that estimates the probability of having observed segregation pattern or more extreme segregation patterns under the null hypothesis of random segregation. So for now, I assume that we know which founders introduced the rare variant to the family, and these founders are called FRB, so founder rare variant. And our statistic, S rare, is the sum of number of affected with rare variants and number of unaffected without rare variants. So given this S rare value and FRB, we enumerate many random inheritance vectors, assuming that FRB introduced the rare variance to the family, and then we calculate the distribution of S rare. And we compute the p-value of S rare by finding the proportion of the IVs that generate the same or more significant S rare. So I have an example in the next slide. So in this pedigree, I assume that all individuals are genotyped. And individuals 9 and 10 at the bottom, I, as they are the affected individuals, the rest of them have missing phenotypes. And then I perform 10,000 10, random IV sampling to estimate the p-value of each s rare values. So there can be s rare value 0, 1, 2, depending on how many the affected individuals have the rare variant, because there's no effect here. And if the founder 1 at the top introduced the rare variant, the p-value of S3 value 2 is about 0.03. However, if the founder 8 introduced the rare variant, the p-value of the same S3 value is much higher, which is 0.25. So the fact that the rare variant is inherited in every generation and shared between the two affected at the last generation is more, more rare event than when the rare variant was directly inherited from the parent. So that's why this has more signal can p-value. However, as you can see, this p-value is unlikely to reach like genome-wide signal can level, like 10 to negative 5 or 10 to negative 8, unless the rare variants segregate in a very large family. So to improve power, I compute three levels of p-values. The first level is the family level p-value, where the p-value is calculated for each family on each rare variant. And the second level is the variant level p-value, where we meta-analyze p-values across different families for one specific rare variant. And the third level is a gene-level p-value, where we meta-analyze p-values across different rare variants in a gene and also across different families. 
and for how many times I have? yeah I mean I have a lot of time so I mean I'm just gonna skip this but I mean we are only interested in rare variants that are shared by at least two affected individuals and we use the variant with low genotype missing rate and for this rare variant we need to identify founders who introduce the rare variant which are who are FRB so basically I use the genotype probability generated by GG imputation so GG imputation generates the genotype probability for everyone in a family who was not even sequenced or genotype in array, so including all founders. So it generates probabilities for three genotypes, one, 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 two, two, two. So I use two approaches to identify FRB using this genotype probability. So in the first approach, I say founder is well imputed if the highest probability among the three genotypes probability is greater than 80%. And if the all founders are well imputed, then we look for founders with a rare variant. The second approach, which is filter number three, is that I include the rare, I keep the rare variant if the all founders except the pair of top founders are well imputed. And if the highest probability for both top founders is about 0.5 for having rare variant. So I'm going to have an example for this. So here in this example, there are eight individuals and four founders, one, two, three, and six, those are founders. And the numbers in the box indicate the genotype probability. So first number indicates the probability of having zero rare allele. The second number indicates probability of one allele. The third number indicates probability of two rare alleles. So in this example, the rare allele was introduced by individual two, and individual four and seven inherit the rare variant. And here, all founders are well imputed because their highest genotype probability is greater than 80%. So I keep this variant, and then I say the uh, founder 2 into a rare variant. This is the example of filter 3. So in this example, found, top founders 1 and 2 have about 50% of probability to having one rare allele. This means that uh, there's equal chance that one of them introduced a rare variant, but we are not sure which one did. So in this case, I just assume that one of them did, and I just, I just select randomly between them. So I'm just going to show that using this approach, we were able to identify 86% of rare variant. Oh, sorry, we are able to identify founders who introduced rare variant for 86% of rare variant. So we were mostly able to identify founders who introduced rare variant using this approach. And as you shown here, about core of rare variant were introduced by two or more founders. And this is the result of segregation for rare SMBs. So we tested 6,421 rare SMBs in about 4,000 genes from our gene set. And none of the p-values are significant after multiple testing correction. And we look at the top gene more carefully, which is ACTR1B. So it has one damaging rare variant in chromosome 2 from the largest family. It doesn't appear in the genome Colombian population. It has very low minor low frequency, about 0.04% in active animal population. However, this is relatively common in our pedigrees. So its minor frequency is 1.89% in our families and 6.76% in the CR2 family. And previous CMB analysis using WCCC2 schizophrenia data found large duplication around this gene associated with schizophrenia, but it didn't replicate. And this segregation was not the perfect segregation because there are higher s rare values available. This is the result of segregation for rare CMBs. We tested 314 rare CMBs in 251 genes. And again, no CMBs are significant, uh, p-values are significant after multiple test correction. So the top gene from the CMB analysis was GOLPH3 gene. It has one rare CMB, relatively short, in one family. And there are like, pro uh, so like, very least linkage study for BP, they found duplication in this gene, segregating with BP on the family specific linkage peak. So there's some like background, I mean some literature supporting this gene. And again, this gene, this uh, segregation was not perfect segregation. So here's the conclusion of my, uh, the conclusion of the paper. So we first look at the genetic architecture of BP1 in these pedigrees. And we found that BP1 individuals carry the greater common risk allele for BP1 than controls, but the magnitude of the polygenic contribution was much smaller compared to those from PGC. 
And unlike page 3, we didn't observe the common risk sniff of schizophrenia contributing to BP1 in our pedigrees. And in terms of rare variants, we observed that BP1 individuals had higher burden of both rare deleterious SMBs and rare CMBs in the gene set that we came up with. And another analysis we did was a segregation analysis. So we found 15 linkage peaks, which have 990 genes. But, and we also developed a new method to identify segregation rare variants, but we didn't observe the rare coding SMBs or CMBs with very strong effect. And I didn't show here, but we also didn't observe the significant burden of genome mutations. So these, these results suggest the polygenic genetic architecture of BP1 in this pedigree where many common and rare variants with small or moderate effect sizes are more likely to increase risk for BP1 than few large effect variants in these pedigrees. And finally, non-coding variants may play an important role in BP1 risk in these pedigrees as we fail to identify any BP1 associated coding variant. And the paper is currently in bioarchive. And I'd like to thank everyone who's involved in this project. I'd like to thank Song Gu and Young Jun in my lab who work on the denome mutation and STRs. And I thank Sue and Arden who work on the PRS, CMB, blood analysis. And I thank Nelson who directed this study and PGC and C Columbia Costa Rica group who shared the data with us. And I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Uh, what do you mean by overall, better? Well, like, we found more interesting results than just the elite cred, so... You mean, did you see the more si significant p-values? Yeah, yeah. I see. I mean, is it... I, I don't know, we didn't test different methods. I guess the elite cred is modeling, so it's just a good way to be better. Yeah, 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 maybe. But I mean, but I don't think that our research will change a lot because the sample size is not that great, right? I mean. Thank you.